to the uh, last active session today. Uh, my name is Sheena Wyatt. I am your chair for this session. You'll see more of me a bit later on whilst I run around in my fabulous sparkly trainers answering all your questions or more to the point sticking this in front of you so that you can ask your questions. You're not here to listen to me. I'm going to hand over very quickly to the wonderful Carl Cap, who's going to be talking to us about gamification. Carl, over to you. Thanks. Hi, everybody. So uh, I have the enviable position between speaking to you between uh, me and cocktail reception. So I thought speaking before lunch was bad, but speaking before a cocktail reception, even worse. So um, I will uh, try my best to get uh, through as uh, engagingly as possible. And I think I'm all set. We ready? OK, great. So my name's uh, Carl Kopp, professor of instructional technology at Bloomsburg University. And Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, so we crossed the pond, so to speak, uh, a few nights ago. And very excited to be here to talk about games and thinking like a game designer. So that's what I want you to think about, first of all. So I actually am going to go old school for a minute. I'd like you to take out maybe a piece of paper or your phone or something like that and write down how or what does an instructional designer think. So if you're going to design instruction, what things would you consider or think about as you design instruction. So I'll go ahead and give you a few moments to go ahead and kind of write those down or think about those or kind of come up with what would you think about if you were designing instruction? A client came to you or an internal person came to you and said, I want you to develop some instruction for us. What kind of things would you think about when you do that? And as you're writing them down, uh, does anybody have a couple of items that they would think about or ask a client or consider? And just want you to know, this would be like the interactive part of the presentation, where I would ask, does anybody have anything? And then you would like give me something. Yes? Intuitive gaming. So you don't have to tell them what you've got to do. It feels like a game. OK, so as an instructional designer, you would think, how does this feel like a game? And how can I make it intuitive? OK, that to totally ruined my concept. But that's OK. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, what other things would you think about? Usability, OK. How do I make this uh, usability and friendly? The what the learning objectives are, yes. Retention. Retention or attention, right? OK. So now the reason why I said this, so now the next question is, how does a game designer think? So if you were a game designer, what kind of things would you think about right away as you decided to design that game? What were some concepts that you would think about? Make it addictive, OK, good. Make it <laughs> intuitive and engaging, as that gentleman said about his instructional design. What else? Uh, competitive. competitive, make it competitive, OK. Uh, others? Fun. fun, make it fun, yep, make it fun. Anything else as a game designer? Challenging, challenging. right, we want to make it challenging. Exactly. So the idea is take a look at your list of what instructional designers think about. Take a look at what desi uh, game designers think about. And they're not a whole lot, a, a few cases, but not a whole lot of kind of interactions, right? There's some differences between them. We think of learning objectives. We think of fun. We think of making it intuitive so the learner knows exactly what they're doing. We think of challenge. We think of content. So I want to talk a little bit about how you can start to think like a game designer instead of instructional designer. So, uh, let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, here is an old game. Some of you may recognize. Anybody recognize this? OK. Anybody play this game? OK. Pong, right? So Pong was a great, great game. So when you played Pong, what were some things that you thought about as you played Pong? Winning. winning. OK, you're right. Yep, I want to I wanna beat somebody. But how, how about the process of winning? What were some things that you thought about the game itself? <coughs> Angles, OK, where do I want it to go? Someone said, right, yeah, exactly. When I had a student one time tell me that he thought about physics when he played Pong. So I had to ask him to leave my classroom. Um, <laughs> it was beyond. But basically, we think about where is the opponent going to go to next? We think of what direction should I try to move the ball? We think about how will the ball bounce off the wall, right? So skills in Pong that were probably not very applicable to tennis or to ping pong. And I would argue probably if you were a good pong player, you probably weren't a good ping, uh, ping pong player or maybe not a good badminton player. But then games evolved a little bit, and we had games like this. Do you recognize this game? Space Invaders, right? A great game uh, that 
uh, just had aliens keep shooting at you and shooting at you almost incessantly, and you couldn't stop them from shooting at you. So what kind of questions or what kind of things did you think about when you played Space Invaders? Hiding? OK, yep. I uh, want to uh, get underneath those little items. I probably thought about, should I shoot the aliens at the middle first or at the end first? Do I, how long do I have before the alien shoots me? Can I pop out and shoot the alien? What's the pattern that these aliens are following, right? I kind of want to look at pattern recognition. So there wasn't a whole lot from those games that we could apply to instructional design, maybe pattern recognition, but not a whole lot, right? So it's kind of uh, doesn't mean you're actually going to be able to, to ward off space invaders if that ever happens. But then we get to uh, the concept of Immerse, immersion. And games were actually immersion. Anybody recognize this game? Pitfall, yes, great. There's some gamers like right over here. So, uh, but uh, Pitfall was a great game. We had interactivity, we had immersion. And when you combine those two, you have sustained engagement. And really, if we think about what we want from our learners, that's what we want, sustained engagement. So how can we figure out how to engage the learners? And we had lots of other games. We had this uh, game as well. Uh, anybody recognize this? I don't know if this is bigger in the UK or not. It was um, Oregon Trail. So uh, it was a game where you uh, had to go through. It was one of the most popular educational games in the United States of all times, mostly, I think, because of the awesome graphics. Um, <laughs> you, would, you could die of dysentery. You could die of attack. Um, and it gave you kind of all the information here that you wanted to do. And it was kind of a story combined with a little bit of action and interactivity, and you thought about things like, what action should I take based on this information? And you had games like, where in the world is Carmen Sandiego, where you had to find uh, this character and, uh, who was hiding somewhere in the world. And then you had games like this. Does anybody recognize this game? Mist. Somebody said Mist. Now, Mist was a really interesting game because it came basically with nothing, right? You put all, well, there were like six CDs, if anybody remembers CDs. Most people look. Like, you don't remember CDs, but I remember CDs. But you put them in the machine, and it would grind through, and it was this world that you were exploring. And the game also had a sister game called Riven. And Riven was kind of like the next level, and you explore this uninhabited planet, you want, or island. You want to talk about immersion. One day at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm playing Riven, uh, because that's what you do at 2 o'clock in the morning. And uh, this little gr I had been down this path like 100 times, right? This little ghostly girl out of nowhere, this one time down the path, just decides to show up. Scare I screamed. I was so scared. My wife comes running into the room like, oh my god, what happened? What happened? And I tried to explain to her that this girl on the computer popped up and it like, was really scary. And So I slept on the couch that night. But um, the idea is you explored this world. So you had questions like, where do I explore first? Or what activities are the most value to me? Or what must I do to achieve my goal? So now you can see how the games are starting to get into things that would be really valuable if you thought about them as you were doing work, right? What activities are the most value? Um, a little bit like what, kind of what Marsha was saying this morning. And if you look here, this is the Sims game. And the Sims games is fascinating because they take everyday life, which a lot of people kind of have a boring routine life, uh, right here, and uh, they made it fun and exciting, right? It was really fun to see if you could get your sim to work on time, right? And if you didn't, your sim would go, wah, 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 you know, like not real English or language, but would yell at you. So you had this think about what variables to keep them happy. You had, I mean, you had to send the sim to the restroom. You had to send their sim to work. You had to send them to the bathroom, all kinds of really interesting things. You think about managing time. We get into worlds like this. Anybody recognize this? It was big for a while, Second Life, right? Really huge, had a huge excitement, and then it kind of instantly died. But, um, we had things like what activity, because there was an economy associated with it, right? So what activities give me the most valuable for money for my efforts? Can I trust this person who wants to team with me to accomplish my goal? Because he didn't know these people. In fact, my son one time was playing Second Life, and I said, Nate, you can play Second Life. He was, I don't know, 12. I said, but you can't talk to anybody, right? Because I don't want you, uh, you know, it's... So I left, I don't know, for an hour. Some of us came back. I said, Nate, what are you doing? He goes, oh my gosh, I just earned 2,000 Lindens. I'm like, Nate, how did you earn 2,000 Lindens? He goes, well, I went into my inventory and I found a motorcycle, and then I went up to people and I sold them the motorcycle. And so I made money. I'm like, Nate, I told you not to talk to anybody, but 
that's okay, I'll take the Lindens. So uh, it was really kind of an interesting environment where you worked around and, and had to meet and work with people that you didn't know. And now we have things like Fortnite, right? Is Fortnite as big here as it is like everywhere? I mean, it's crazy, Fortnite, uh, big deal there. Uh, really interesting how you go onto this island and basically it's a last person standing kind of battle royale kind of environment and it sparked a lot of dancing. So I guess in the middle of killing all these people, we break out and dance. So um, that's that world, but it's really kind of interesting as well. How can we work together to achieve victory? Which is interesting because you have to be strategic because you want to pick somebody that's going to help you get to the end, but you want to pick somebody that at the end you can eliminate, right? So it's really kind of what's the strategy involved with that? And uh, one of the hottest channels on YouTube is watching people play video games. It's called eSports. And in fact, in 2024, they're talking about having eSports as an Olympic event, if you can believe it. And I have a student, uh, I teach classes, I have a student who's 23 years old who used to be a professional gamer. He had to retire because he wasn't fast enough. So how's that for a concept? So when we think about jobs in the future, literally 10 years ago, nobody thought there'd be a job as professional eSport player. But now I'm thinking, I, I don't have this Twitch speed, but maybe I could be a professional eSport manager or something like that, right? That might be kind of interesting. Or coach or, and this is Minecraft. So if you have younger kids, uh, you know Minecraft, about creating things in Minecraft. What can we create together? So all kinds of things. So we look at the research. So, so do games really work from a learning perspective? It looks like there's a lot of potential. The answer is yes, absolutely they do. This is a game called Darfur is Dying. So it was about the refugee crisis in Darfur. And some researchers did a really interesting study. Basically, you choose to be one of the refugees. You can choose either one. And then you have to hide from the rebels who are trying to kill you. So you have to get food, you have to get water, and you have to avoid the rebels who are trying to kill you. And they did some research about would people donate money after playing this game uh, Darfur is dying. And they did several experiments. One indicated that playing the game resulted in a greater willingness to help than simply reading about something or simply being having it explained to you, right? Or uh, reading the text. So the immersion part of the game made people more willing to help. They did another experiment and they found that playing the game resulted in greater role taking, which means taking responsibility and wanting to help out and also uh, help, expressing wanting to help more than either watching other people play the game or actually reading about it. So we know games have what are called pro-social impact. We always think of the negative social impact of games, but there's a lot of pro-social. Here's another example. Researchers did an experiment with three different games. A pro-social game, which in this case was called Lemmings, where you helped uh, gather, guide lemmings to safety. Then there was a anti-social game called Lamers. And basically, you tried to kill as many lamers as possible. You could blow them up. You could shoot them. You could whatever. I told you it's antisocial. And then the middle game is Tetris. That was kind of a neutral game. It's not anti or pro-social. And they did this really interesting experiment. They had a person in a lab, and they spilled a can of pencils accidentally and wanted to see if somebody would help pick up the pencils. Now, when I explain this to my students, I have to describe to them what a pencil is and how it works. I think we're all good here. So this is the game Lamers. After people played it for 15 minutes, 22% of the people helped to pick up pencils. So not too bad, but uh, not too great. A quarter of the population. Tetris, not much better, 33%. So uh, antisocial kind of had that impact. But people that played the pro-social game, 67% helped pick up pencils, thinking it was a pro-social activity and something that they needed to do. So pro-social gaming can really help influence people. And not just in this study, there's been lots of studies that show pro-social game improves pro-social interactions. Here's another example. They said, well, maybe uh, Lemmings is the world's best pro-social game. So maybe we should pick a different game. And picking up pencils, eh, you know, let's make the stakes a little bit higher. Let's have a male cohort come in, female researcher, and say, very angrily, where have you been? I've been looking for you all day. Come with me immediately. And then grab her shoulder and see what happens. Uh, it was all, it was play acting to see what would happen. The people didn't play Tetris. They played uh, a game called City Heroes, where you, it's no city anybody would want to live in because every building is on fire pretty much. And you fly a helicopter to save people or put out the buildings. In the antisocial environment, 22% intervened. 
in the uh, high stakes uh, other environment, 56% um, of people intervened. So there's actually uh, research behind the fact that pro-social games. So think of this, if you happen to work in retail and you want your retail associates to have a more um, uh, friendly demeanor toward clients or customers, they can play a game for 10 or 15 minutes and then go ahead and actually go out and be uh, more pro-social than if they hadn't played the game. So, uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Oh, that's all right. Well, there's been, this was a, a study that did not study it longitudinally, but there have been longitudinal studies literally around the world that have showed that it does have a long-term pro-social impact. So then the other question that you're probably dying to ask, or someone has said, well, then do antisocial games have an antisocial uh, component as well? You can't have one without the other, right? So there's, there's probably... Uh, and there has been some research that shows antisocial. It doesn't, however, seem to be quite as strong, but in the people that it's strong in, like for example, um, uh, 18 to 25 year old US American white males, it has a devastating effect, right? So there are, there, it's not, games are not, they're like anything else, right? So some people say to me, oh, video games are horrible, they're so violent, whatever but some of the most violent things that have ever, ever on earth are written in books, right? So we don't ban all books. We might ban certain books or disallow certain books. Video games are the same way, right? So, like, so for example, when my son was young, I would not let Grand Theft Auto in my house, right? If you know Grand Theft Auto. So my wife's like, why not? Like all Nick, Nate's friends play Grand Theft Auto. Why don't you let you know, them play? And I'm like, okay, let me explain to you what you can do in Grand Theft Auto. So I explained to her. And she's like, yeah, we're not having that in our house. So um, there's definitely some lines, I think, that need to be drawn, especially with young uh, children as well. But there's also some positives as well. So that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, this is the game uh, World of Warcraft. And very interestingly, there was a study in the Harvard Business <laughs> Review that found that people were using World of Warcraft to study leadership strategies. So if you think about it, World of Warcraft is you get a bunch of people together, probably who have never even met each other. They get together and they have to divide up treasure and experience points where they're not even enough for everybody on the team. So you've got to figure out how you're going to do this and how it's going to work and how you're going to play on the team. So if you've ever heard, if there's any gamers in here, you know, a good example would be Leroy Jenkins, right? Uh, so his friends spent a lot of time with this really elaborate plan to go in and attack somebody, and <laughs> Leroy Jenkins just ruined the plan. He just ran into the room and started swinging. So uh, bad leadership there in terms of Leroy. Um, so why does all this matter? Why are we talking about all these and setting the stage? It matters because think of what we are as instructional designers, right? One of the things that confronts us every day is so much content. So when you start to do a course with a uh, subject matter expert, what's one of the first things that happen? This would be like an interactive. Like when I put a, 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 a what is it, an interrogative word in front of what I'm saying, it's a question. Um, so what, are, what would be something that you would be thinking about when um, you're going to design a course for an, uh, with a subject matter expert? What's one of the first things that happens? Content, right? They typically give you like all these PowerPoint slides <laughs> that maybe make sense to somebody in the dark recesses of 2 o'clock in the morning, but to you, it makes no sense, right? And you've got to figure out how this content becomes actual actionable. But a game designer doesn't think about content first. A game designer thinks about what actions should happen. And if you think about learning, the re reason why we do learning in an organization is because we want a certain behavior. We want a certain result. In fact, there was some research study I saw that said that organizations, less than 6% of organizations are actually able to change learner behavior. The money we spend on training, only 6% are saying it. So instructional designers think content first, game designers think action first. They think what action should the player take, right? So maybe it's answering a question. So think about how we start, my favorite thing is think about how we start instruction. How do we start most uh, instructional modules. Background. Even before that, how do we start? 
learning objectives. Sometimes I call them learning objections, right? Why do I call them that? Because they're what are called uh, closed loops. So you say to a salesperson, today we're going to learn four ways to close a sale. What does a good salesperson say? I know five ways, good luck, right? But what if you change that? What if you said, wouldn't you like to know the number one way sales are closed in our organization? Stay tuned, right? So now you've got their attention. They want to know what's happening. So ask a question. They might know the right answer or they might not, but the question draws them in. Another thing is make a decision, right? Have a learner make a decision. One of the things that we've done, which is really interesting, is sometimes before class, we'll send out a little scenario with three answers, and all answers are wrong. So when people get to class, they're like, oh, I thought that, now they're all wrong. They can't be right, right? They're buzzing, they're talking about it. Sometimes we'll do that where all four answers are right to get people talking about, you know, what's the answer. So have them make a decision. Have them discipline employee, right? You teach training all the time, probably. Here's our policy about attendance. It needs to be da-da-da. But why don't you start it? There's a, a woman that works in your retail store. She's the best retail employee you have, but she's come to work five times late this week. And a fellow employee is complaining about her. She arrives late the sixth time. What do you say to her? Right? We know the policy says six times and you're done. You're, you're finished. But she's your best employee. Right? What do you have to do? Right? So have them uh, discipline an employee. Solve a mystery. Assume a role. Right? You are now the role of the customer. What are you going to do in this situation? Right? Give them a chance to wear shoes on the other feet. Write a proposal. Have them do some kind of work there. Or violate a policy. I, I always like, um, uh, you, have, uh, uh, you watch uh, CSI, right? It's, it's kind of, uh, what I understand, kind of big over here. So I'll show you how much fun I am. Every uh, night that CSI is on, I always turn to my wife and I say, hmm, I wonder if anybody's going to die this episode. Right? So... That's how much fun I am. So uh, for those of you who don't know, somebody dies in every episode of CSI, right? OK, yeah. All right, uh, this is the staid British uh, kind of uh, demeanor. You can feel free to laugh at any time. OK, so uh, prioritize resources. So what happens is what they do, though, they have a cycle in there. They have you think it's one thing, and then they have you actually give the answer, right? So 15 minutes in, you think, ah, the butler did it. I got it. That's really cool. But then you find out, nah, the butler really didn't do it. Hmm, I wonder who it is. And then they kind of do that. So that's kind of that asking questions, keeping interest, uh, solving or having a mystery throughout. And make a difficult trade-off, right? One of the things I think we've done in training as a real disservice is we've made it too easy. If we make things so easy that people say, yeah, whatever, I don't care, then they don't care, right? We've got to make the difficult decisions. Clients don't decide to be easy on you. They decide to be difficult. I don't know how many of you have had, we've developed some really difficult scenarios and have managers come to us and say, that's too hard, right? The quiz at the end or the question at the end is too hard. And I said, well, OK, let me ask you this question. Do clients ever put really hard things in front of, in front of us? Well, yes, we do. Well, shouldn't the first time something be hard be in a safe space? Why do they have to experience that in front of the client? For example, I was doing a, a presentation one time at a hospital, and somebody said, hey, I heard that in simulations, medical simulations, the patient should never die because it's kind of traumatic for the learner. And I said to this, they were at a hospital, and I said to the, at the hospital, I said, does anybody ever die at this hospital? Because if not, this is where I'm coming when I get sick, right? Because I like that. And they're like, no, unfortunately, people die. And I said, so you want the first time a medical professional experiences the trauma of death to be the actual trauma of death. You don't want them to see it in a simulation or an experience like that. They're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense, right? So kind of having the experience. So for example, I've been in an organization, they say, we don't like our learners to fail because you know, they might learn that failure is the right way to go, or they might you know, claim that's the right thing to do. But we actually learn a lot from failure. So we shouldn't really do that. We should make it uh, really difficult. So uh, difficulty is good. Not overly difficulty, but difficulty is good. So let's look at learning objectives, right? So these are the typical learning objectives, right? Upon completion of this course, anybody recognize, you know, the language, right? I believe it cuts learners off right away. Instead, we need to do things like create these open loops. 
So an open loop is a question or something that's not answered. And a really good example of that is if you've ever watched um, uh, Law and Order London. How many people have ever watched that show, Law and Order London? A few people have, not many. Ah, disappointing because it's one of the few programs apparently that started in the States and then moved to, you know, you, we've got a lot of programs that like uh, The Office and everything that come to the States. But anyway, in that program, it's, it's a murder mystery and you always try to find out like who did it. So how many people here have ever watched a murder mystery? Okay, how many people have like late at, late at night been flicking through TV, found a murder mystery, and now couldn't go to bed till you found out who done it, right? And, and, and you have a meeting like the next morning, right? That's, that's an open loop. We don't like as humans open loops. And how many people remember after they watched the end that it was a repeat and you actually yeah. saw it before but you couldn't remember? Right, so that's kind of an open loop. So learning objections, uh, objections objectives, sorry, uh, actually are a closed loop. We want to keep things open. Most of the way we end training classes are closed loops. Wouldn't it be better to say, hey, now that you know these five ways to close a sale, wouldn't you like to know the number one way to open a sale? Go to that class, right? Do that kind of serialized uh, excitement or engagement. Uh, is anybody here familiar with uh, that show, Breaking Bad? Yeah, so we, you know, that it's about chemistry for those of you that don't know, but, um, <laughs> At the end of that show, you were always sucked into the next show because there was some mystery or some cliffhanger that you couldn't believe. Ha like, Walter's the guy that knocks? Oh my gosh, I have to watch like, the next episode. Another one would be, um, if you've ever watched a show, uh, well, there's a show here called Location, Location, Location. We have a show like that in the States called House Hunters. So for those of you who don't know, they take a couple that have no business even being in the same room together, but somehow they're married. Because he likes like country, or he likes technology and gadgets. She wants to live in the country. He wants new stuff. She wants old stuff. He wants room for the dog. She wants to have a cat. Like these people should not be in the same room. And then they show them like three different houses and none of them meet their criteria. So you wonder like, who's this real estate agent who's not meeting any of their criteria? But anyway, um, and then they have a budget that's like, you know, hi, I collect trash for a living. Hi, I collect aluminum cans on the floor and trade them in for money. Oh, okay, well, what's your budget? Uh, two, four, two to four million dollars. Like, you're like, who are these people? And they're like 12 years old. Like, you can't believe that they're... But basically, the premise of that show works because at the end of the show, I'm yelling at them, like, why did you pick that house? That was so stupid. You know, pick another house. Because it's this unfit criteria that you have to make fit. And they have to make fit. Too many times in training, all of our material fits perfectly, right? The scenario works flawlessly. The client acquiesces at the end and accepts the sale. But that's not real. Sometimes you could do everything right and still fail. And some of that, I think, needs to be in training. Like in games, right? You can do lots of really good game things, but sometimes this non-player character comes out of nowhere. He wasn't there the last 10 times I tried this level. He shows up and shoots you, right? So those are the kind of uh, uncertainty or novelty that really happens. We want to have challenge in our learning. We actually, as humans, like challenges. We like to, you know, why do you climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. That's like lame reason, right? But not the humans. Humans are like, of course, let's go, right? Why are you going to go to the moon? Why are you going to Mars? We do it because we like a challenge. So if we challenge our learners appropriately, they're into it, right? If we spoon feed them information that's dummy down for them, they're not as into it. Now, you need to be careful, right? You can't have them you know, challenge and challenge and challenge and then they give up, right? We want to add hints. We want to add ideas to help them. So video games do that really well, right? If you're not doing really well, the video game will say, hey, do you want a hint? The first hint they give you is a really kind of a vague hint. It's not even a hint. I don't even know why they put it in there, but they can't figure that out either. The second hint is, oh, think about doing this and this. It's a little more specific. The third hint is, okay, idiot, here's how you do it, right? So it gives you that kind of information. Think about that from a training perspective, right? We have something that's called desirable difficulties. And this is fascinating research that shows that things that are easier to learn right away are actually more difficult to recall later on. Think about it. If you learn something just like this, you're, uh, you got it. No problem. No difficulty. No difficulty at all regurgitating it right away. But six weeks, you don't even remember. right? So we want to make things a little bit difficult. 
We also want to think about, instead of learning objectives, objectives uh, think about creating a skills map. So this is a skills map for the game Assassin's Creed, which was one of my favorite games, except when they go out into real life and talk about the animus. I don't care. Uh, everything else I think is pretty cool. But um, basically, you can build skill sets as hunters, warriors, seers, and you collect ability points. And it gives you, uh, one of uh, Marcia's slides this morning was about, um, she had on there, she didn't mention it, but she said autonomy, connectedness, and um, complexity, right? Yeah, so she had those three things on there. So this is about autonomy. Learners want to make their own decisions. Why don't we let them make their own decisions about what skill sets that they want to acquire? There's usually some flexibility in that, so we want to do that. And we can do it smartly. So when my son was young, we told him, hey, you can go to bed at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, your choice. I knew he was going to bed at 8 o'clock, because no way would he pick 7.30. But I gave him that sense of choice, sense of command. So we want to think about that. Think about this creating not learning objectives, objectives, but create a skills map so people can figure out where they want to go and what they want to learn and what information they want to apply. So think about, as a game designer, redesigning instruction to start with a challenge. Let me give you an example of this. We did training uh, for a United States Department of Defense company that had to do a lot of internal investigations because I guess people were not uh, following all the rules. And the instruction was so beautifully designed from a classical standpoint, right? We had the learning objections, objectives. We had the, um, now I say it so often. Anyway, uh, we had the terminology. We had the um, model. We had the forms. And then we had a role play at the end, right? So probably some people recognize that kind of design of the instruction. And everyone at the end knew about doing investigation, but no one really knew how to do one. So we changed the training around. It was a three-day in-person class. People came into class. We had them sit at tables. We said, welcome to class. You're on an auditing team. You're going to conduct an investigation. Uh, one of your peers has just come to you and accused your boss of embezzling $10,000. What do you do? That was it. No icebreaker, nothing. They sat around, and they're like, well, what do we do? So for 10 minutes, there was kind of like this uncertain, awkward feeling. Then somebody said, oh, well, what does the company policy say? Exactly. And then they all went to the, oh, what questions would I ask? And then they all went, then they said, well, we would want to talk to you, da, da, da. And we had some people lined up as, you know, the manager and your peer, and then we would bring them in, and they would talk to them. At the end of that two and a half days, they had actually conducted an investigation. They had actually gotten to the bottom of what the issue was. They weren't learning about how to do an investigation. They were conducting an investigation. And you know what? They learned the vocabulary. They used all the forms. They learned the model. And they did the role play. So think about how can you upend your training and make it start with the challenge instead of the content, instead of the objections, objectives. Sorry. Uh, provide a safe learning environment. So we always want to have safe learning environments so nobody gets upset and everybody's always nice. But when you think about it, we want to put the player at risk a little bit. Video games, when you start off the video game, you're at risk. Run to point A to point B without being shot at by this guy or without falling through the lava. And think about being fun at risk. Did you ever see those videos on YouTube where there's a little boy and his dad is a special effects guy? And so he's... Uh, jumping from furniture to furniture because the floor is literally lava, right? Did anybody do that as a kid? Like you're jumping. We want to be at risk. It's, it's, I'm not scared about stepping on a floor, but I'm scared about stepping on lava, right? So we want to build in risk. So we want to put the learner at risk, at, at mock risk though, not at real risk, right? Don't go out and harm your learners and say, oh, well, Carl said we could do it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying a little bit of risk. So the risk of starting over. So a really interesting thing we did in this uh, training class one time, this, uh, this e-learning module, we said at the beginning of the module, at the end of this module, you will receive five questions. If you get all five questions correctly, you're done. If you miss one, you'll get five more questions. It was amazing the focus those people had on that learning module, because nobody wanted to answer 10 questions when you could only answer five questions. So think about ways that you can help people focus on the learning. One is not solving a problem. We like to solve problems. 
there's a situation where we can't solve it, people will work really hard to try to solve the problem, give them that situation. Maybe losing points in a game, maybe not achieving recognition. You're not going to be on the leaderboard, or you're not going to be able to do this. That doesn't happen. Losing points, as I said. Set the learner up for failure. So you might say, well, that doesn't seem like really fair. But actually, we learn an awful lot from failure. There's a hugely interesting article in the Harvard Business Review about lots of us think that um, we learn a lot from observing ourselves fail, like we learn a lot from our failure, but we actually learn more from watching the failure of others. So they did this research on physicians, and they found out that physicians uh, recorded higher learnings by watching other physicians fail. Mainly they think because the physicians are going, there's no way I'm doing that. I'm going to make sure I don't fail, or that's not a situation I want to be in myself. So think about, can you allow people to see what failure looks like so that they know how to avoid that failure? When we fail ourselves, sometimes we think about external factors. Well, the reason why that didn't work out was because of this, or that didn't work out because of that, right? But if we see somebody else, we can say, oh, they failed because they didn't have the right tools, or because they didn't follow the right procedure, or because, so we can step back and kind of look at that failure. Some other really interesting research in the area of math shows that our brains actually provide more electrical activity when we get an answer wrong than we do when we get the answer right. And actually our brain grows through failure. And the other interesting thing about that research was that you didn't have to know that you were getting the answer wrong, just that struggle that you have whether or not it's the right answer. So failure is a really powerful thing. And um, another really interesting research was about um, what they call unconscious incompetence, right? So when you first start a job, people say, oh, they don't know what they don't know, and so they're very dangerous. But actually, you're more dangerous about uh, when you've been doing the job for about six months. After that, then you become more, because you think you got it, right? Oh, I got this, no problem. But you don't. So beginners are actually more conscious than people who have just a little bit of experience. So you want to think about that as well. OK, so uh, I've been talking for a while. It's time for Twitter mission. So if anybody wants to send a tweet, or I'll take three questions at this time as well, and then we'll continue on. So who has a question? So far. N nobody has a question? Can't you just make one up for me? Ah, there's one. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my name is Atul. I'm from NEC Corporation. And, uh, there are many um, seminars I've attended about gamification and you know, I've been to this conference as well. But the pressing question always for me as an instructional designer has been, what tools would I use? Uh, or are there any recommended tools that you would uh, suggest to the audience here? OK, great, great uh, question. Um, so two things about that question. One is I think uh, gamification is a design affordance first, uh, technology second. So when we think about designing for gamification, think about things like adding narrative, the freedom to fail, starting with questions, starting with challenge. So those are all good things, I think, to do that. Then in terms of tools, uh, there's lots of different vendors out there that have lots of different tool sets. So there's some gamification that's related to learning. And so they'll help you reinforce learning over time. There's some gamification tools out there that are tied directly to processes and procedures. So there's some gamification there. There's some vendors that have 3D simulations, some in VR, some not in VR. So I would say first see what the problem is and, and then look at the tools. Um, so there's a lots of uh, different ways to look at it and kind of go it from there. Uh, I can Offline, I can kind of tell you vendors. But every time I list vendors, then I forget some vendor. And then afterwards, I get these nasty emails like, well, how come you didn't mention our solution? So uh, I'm not going to do that. But uh, I will uh, privately afterwards if anybody wants to do that. OK, another question. Yes? Are you the vendor who's going to yell at me for forgetting? Um... Thank you. Thank you. So I think everything you said is pretty awesome. Um, Great, thank you. There you go. Um, I don't work for you either, do I? No. <laughs> so so I, I, I do. I think it's all awesome. I think um, in terms of the organization I work in, I think it's a huge mindset change to move from 
I guess, a traditional way in terms of engaging and learning and, and how colleagues do that to what you're talking about in terms of gamification. Have you got an example of where you've worked with an organization that has gone through that mindset or cultural shift right. to achieve that, what they're achieving now? That, that's a great question. So um, sometimes I'll often say that game is a four letter word. So uh, don't use the word game. Call it an interactive experience or an interactive situation. Or sometimes I call it a genuine, authentic memory enhancement system. Um, <laughs> But the idea, what we typically do is we typically will introduce it without like a lot of game fanfare. Like a lot of times, unfortunately, people will lead with gamification. Like, oh, this is gamification. It'll be really fun. It'll be really neat. But you should really lead with the business problem that you're solving. So we've got sales associates who are not engaged or who know less than somebody who comes in and looks it up on the internet. So here's how we're going to solve that problem. We're going to make this engaging, interesting experience for them and we're going to allow them to get feedback. Like one really great thing about gamification, if it's done right, it can give you feedback about the correctness of your answers or how much um, struggle you're having to find some knowledge and things like that through points and things like that. So you can give somebody a report card that gives them the tools to know how they do better. The main thing that you need to do with gamification, like people say, oh, I want to gamify sales. Let's gamify sales, right? So whoever sells the most wins. That's not a really good gamification example because whoever sells the most wins automatically, right? So if you say whoever wins the most gets a trip to Hawaii or gets prizes, whatever, the people that already know how to sell are going to win. So what you want to do is break down, well, what in our selling process are people not doing? So maybe it's following up with clients and then gamify following up with clients because that's the behavior that you want to uh, uh, reward and you want people to keep having. So don't gamify at the really high level. Gamify at the specific task or behavioral level. Don't call it gamification. Call it engagement. Um, look for, don't lead with gamification. Lead with the business results that you're looking for. So those are some ways that you can help that. And some campaigns are a little bit helpful, but those ways I think can be very helpful. A lot of times with learning and development, we don't lead with the business problem that we're trying to solve, but, but nobody else but us cares about the learning component. Everybody else cares about the business component. So let's lead with the business. OK, one more question on our Twitter mission. No? Ah, yes. <laughs> OK, so she's got the opposite problem. She's got a client who, we want gamification. Make everything gamification. So I always say that we need to be very careful about what we gamify because if we gamify everything, then, then nothing's going to work, right? So I, I tend to ch try to choose the things that are going to bring the most value and are the easiest to implement. So, and then I'm a huge proponent of pilot testing. So rather than roll it out to everybody, to all 10,000 employees all at once and find out they've got a machine that's incompatible with what you want to try to do or something like that, roll it out to a small group and then leverage the excitement of that small group to take it everywhere else. But yeah, definitely, so I would say to the client, you know, hey, I'm a learning and development uh, expert, even though Marsha said there's no experts. But um, learning and development expert, and um, I understand your enthusiasm for gamification. I think it's great, but let's be strategic about it. In fact, there's a, a bunch of research that shows that the more strategic you are about gamification, the better it will be for the learners. The more, ta if you just do it tactically, it's not as effective. So thanks, everybody, for your three questions. We'll, we'll just get going. Uh, so the next slide is uh, just the facts, right? We tend to use bulleted lists all the time. So I always say bulleted lists don't, uh, bullets don't kill people. Bulleted lists kill people, right? So um, bullet, bulleted lists do not live in nature, right? It's something human made. But what does live in nature are stories. Storytelling provides a context. Most games have storytelling. Leveraging storytelling is a powerful tool. In fact, there's research that shows that learners recall factual information better when it's embedded in a story than through a list of bolts. So think about using that. And let me give you an example here. This is like the ultimate gamification. This is Nike Plus. So when Nike first came out, it was all like gamified and everything like that. But it was all extrinsic motivation, points badges and leaderboards, right? Points in terms of miles, there's literally badges, there's a leaderboard of where I am. But if you only do extrinsic motivation, it eventually, the only way to keep it going is to add more external bonuses. 
Let me give you an example of this. When my son was young, we used a star chart for him. Anybody here use a star chart? I see some people, yep. So a star chart, basically, you don't know, you, get a, you do a chore and you get a star, right? And at the end, sometimes it's called frowny brownies, all that kind of stuff. But my son was young. I said, Nate, we got the star chart for you. Go upstairs, brush your teeth, you'll get a star. I never saw that kid move so fast in my entire life. He was upstairs brushing his teeth. I'm like, this is awesome. In fact, I turned to my wife and I go, I don't know why people have struggle with being a parent. This is really easy. <laughs> and he's 16, I'll just tell him, hey, you want to drive a car? You got to earn some stars. So that lasted like three days. The third day, I'm like, Nate, go upstairs, brush your teeth, you'll get a star. He goes, I don't want a star. I'm like, what do you mean you don't want a star? I don't want a star. I'm like, well, why not? He goes, I want two stars, <laughs> right? And then the next day, four stars, right? Extrinsic motivation only motivates if it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So now we give him a candy bar and he brushes his teeth, right? It doesn't work. So if your gamification is only tied to external rewards, it won't work. You've got to tie it to internal rewards, right? <laughs> the reason why we're following up with the customer, you know, in the sales gamification is because it will lead to sales, you know? So that's why you're doing this. Oh, and by the way, you'll get some points, right? So combining the two is really powerful. They don't live, uh, some people have said, you know, extrinsic motivation kills intrinsic motivation. But actually, it's fascinating. Some of the original research was made so that somebody could not report being internally and externally motivated at the same time. The instrument just didn't allow it. So then they came to the conclusion that if you're externally motivated, you won't be internally motivated. But that's not true. Think of sometimes when, you're, when you've got a job, you love your job, but you couldn't do it without money, right? That's internal and external motivation. You want to go back to school because you like to learn and it's exciting, but also you'll get a raise. That's internal and external motivation. They work together all the time. So Nike Run, after a while, I didn't do Nike Run anymore. It kind of got boring for me. But I don't stop running. I still run, but now I run from zombies. So there's an application called Zombies Run, and it takes place in post-apocalyptic Earth. right? So we all know that post-apocalyptic Earth is inhabited by zombies. right? It's not a question of if. It's when this is going to happen. And when I talk to pharmaceutical companies, I always say, you know, I hope you're working on a cure for the zombie virus because I want to be first in line. I'll be a guinea pig for that. But it's a really kind of interesting. You're doing exactly the same thing as Nike Plus. You're a runner in post-apocalyptic Earth, and you run along, it goes, boop, you picked up some medicine. Boop, you picked up some uh, ammunition. Goes run, go to Sector 12. There's no zombies over there. You got to get some supplies. Of course, you're running, and it goes, oh, my gosh. Sector 12, there is zombies, run. So at that point, I don't recommend yelling at the top of your lungs, zombies, everybody get out of here, because then your friends will quit running with you. But um, it, now you're doing interval training, right, because you're running from the zombies. So it gives you that story that kind of can motivate you to get along, that serial, so to speak. So think about your training. Is there a way that you could put your training modules into a story that guides the learner through the learning process. So instead of being all these disjointed learning events or courses or things like that, can they come under one umbrella? So you can kind of watch that. And the fascinating thing to me is we like to watch this all the time. Like, I think training would be awesome as a reality TV show, right? You guys have, I'm sure you have some reality TV shows. We have one called The Jersey Shore. <laughs> which I am convinced people actually lose brain cells when they watch that show. But they have a woman named Snooky on this show. And Snooky, like, I, I'm not sure how she gets up and has breakfast in the morning, but somehow she manages. But she'll do something stupid, and then they'll have like a little cutout of her explaining, trying to explain why she did that stupid thing, right? Well, the reason why I did that was because, and you're watching her do the thing right here. That would be a great training because a lot of our training is mental, and we don't know, okay, that guy made the decision to you know, um, say this to the client at this point, but why? Wouldn't it be great to have like a little bu bubble where he could explain, this is why I did that because of these. So think about that from a training perspective, I think can be really, really helpful. Also some really interesting research from the brain is that when we read a story about certain activities, those areas that are in the story actually activate in our brain. So if we're reading about problem solving, the frontal cortex actually lights up under an MRI. A story is almost a vicarious practice for what we're going to be doing. So think about scenarios, think about stories that your company can tell, 
Think about providing people information in a story-based format, making them part of the story. So here, if a character moved, the corresponding region in the brain of the person that matched movement lit up. So stories are rehearsal. And you think about Olympic athletes. Before they dive or ski, you'll see them go like this, right? They're actually literally visualizing themselves doing that. So helping the learner visualize success and doing that is something that we should think about as well. We also need to think about reflection. A lot of times we have to get as much content as we possibly can into the learner's head, but without reflection there's no learning, just experience. So it behooves us to take some time at the end of learning and ask the learner to reflect on how they would apply. You know, Donald uh, Taylor talked about the bridge. This is a bridge thing. How would you reflect upon the content and use that content at work? And we even go through an exercise where we have the students like kind of journal the class if it's an instructor-led class. And then at the end of the journal, there's a question, how are you going to apply this at work? It's fascinating because research shows that the, we are more likely to reach a goal if we actually write it down than if we just think about it. So if you want to reach a goal, you write down the goal. If you want to help learners reflect, have them write down what they reflect upon. And these learning journals are really kind of an interesting thing. It always fascinates me as a university professor that you know, I had to do so many essays and so many papers and everything as a university student, but then when you get out into the world of work, everything's multiple choice, right? There's no, uh, I'm not tested or asked to do an essay or whatever, yet almost all my deliverables are written deliverables. You know, I have to do a proposal or I have to do a business report or I have to do whatever, yet I don't practice that at all anymore as a working <coughs> professional. So think about having people write down and reflect. That can be really, really important. Also think about learning. We think about learning takes place in a specific order. You know, you got to learn this, you got to learn this, you got to learn that. But we don't learn like that, right? We kind of learn in kind of a nebulous kind of way. I'm trying to learn Portuguese right now because uh, I do some work in Brazil, right? So I know a couple phrases in Portuguese, but I'm also learning nouns in Portuguese, and I'm also learning to conjugate uh, to have in Portuguese. But I'm not learning like a linear way. I'm learning in different ways. So sometimes I'll look at a YouTube video. Sometimes I'll bring up my Duolingo. I have some friends who live in Portuguese. Sometimes I try to speak to them in Portuguese. It's not, it's not pretty. Uh, but kind of learning the language. So we don't have to learn in sequences. Go back to our learner chosen order, right? Self-determination theory, autonomy, <coughs> mastery, and uh, connectedness. Think of open worlds. This is uh, Red Dead Redemption. I don't know if anybody's played that game. Uh, it's made by the same people as Grand Theft Auto, but basically it's a wide world. You could, uh, you could ride your horse into the desert. You could ride wherever you want. It's this completely open world. When I talk about open world, some people say, well, Carl, this is all great, but we don't have a budget of rock star games, right? We can't afford that. But don't worry. Remember Zelda? They, they, well, that was really simple. Just literally a series of rooms that you went in. Now, they spent a lot on graphics, but uh, the rooms uh, were the idea of the nonlinear sequence. Is there any way that you can make your learning nonlinear, allowing the learner a sense of going where they want, when they want, how they want? That can be really kind of important. So think about that from that perspective. Also, um, here is uh, Pitfall again. And I just want to put this up there because there were actually two levels in Pitfall. You could run on the top or you could sneak down and jump over the scorpions, right? So again, that had one screen, but allowed you that different choice. So to go back, gamification and gamified learning and thinking like a game designer is thinking about these constraints and the level of engagement, not about using technology. The only technology they had was side scrolling, but they made it multi-level. So think about, can you do that in your training and instruction? So we also think about training, we think about mastery perf before performance, right? We've got to teach you everything you need to know before you do X, right? But actually, think about games. Games are performance before mastery almost all the time. Like, there's not a big, long tutorial on how to drive a car in Mario Kart. You're put in the cart, and you're told to go. 
right? And the first five times, you're not really successful, right? Because uh, Bowser or somebody runs you off the road. But eventually, you figure out how to do it. You gain mastery. Adult learners only learn when they know they don't know something. So if learners come into your learning environment, either online or they come into a classroom, and they think they know the content, and most adult learners, we think we know the content, they're not open to learning. I believe one of our roles as a designer of game-like learning is to show the adult learner what they don't know. Make them go, ah, maybe I don't know this. And they don't have to do it out loud because we don't want to look foolish out loud. But we want to put them through that situation. So in that example where I said, OK, a peer has come to you and accused their boss of embezzlement, what do you do? They, didn't know, they literally didn't know what to do. So they had to kind of solve the problem. So we look at the research of Malcolm Knowles. We know adult learners learn best when they know they don't know something. I think our job is to help them realize what they don't know to make them open to learning, or for them to choose what they don't know, and we saw kind of the pathway before. So think about that. Also think about we want to give feedback to the learner. Uh, games do an awesome job of giving feedback. How do you know you're successful in Pac-Man? What's that? Somebody said. When you're alive. When you're alive. When you're alive. Exactly. When you're live. What, what's another indicator? No dots, right? You've eaten all the dots. You know you're successful. Now, how do you know you're not successful in Pac-Man? Right, we could probably all do the sound, right? That's immediate um, progressive feedback, right? How many of your learning courses have that immediate progressive feedback? Not many, not many. But that's how we shape behavior. So what we want to do is we want to create that. So we have games like The Sims, for example, that provide feedback on lots of different dimensions, right? They have dimension of um, visual feedback. You can uh, hear things happening. You can see what trade-offs you make. Really a higher level of cognitive thinking that has to take place. We can do this in games. For example, this is a game we did for a pharmaceutical company. We called it a simulation because they didn't like games. Same thing. But what we did was we had three levels of scoring, credibility, meeting the needs, and the products sold. So you couldn't just sell a lot of products and be successful because that's not what you want. You want to build that relationship. You want to build that credibility. So take what you want to do and add multiple measures to provide the feedback. At the end of this, depending on how you answered the question, you got a little report that gave you feedback on you answered this, you should have answered this. You answered this, you should have answered this. So providing learners with feedback about their own learning and their own process will help them tremendously. And think about games. Anybody here like a hardcore gamer? OK, one person. So have you ever gone to like a couple people, maybe, uh, like a, a gaming forum, like online? How, wh why do you do that? Yeah, so in your past. But why? Not, and not at work. He did this at home. So, <laughs> but why would you go to like a game forum? to meet fellow players, and what did you talk about? The game right, the game strategy, exactly. So you figure out, so what if it would be great if you had experience where learners played a game in your company and then could go and talk about it, right? We want them to talk about it. Um, I read a story one time about a CEO who uh, demanded that every employee has to give three new ideas at the end of every week. And a consultant was in the company, and the consultant found out that guess what was happening? There was this whole brokering of ideas throughout the company. So if somebody had like four ideas, he would say, I'll give you an idea of this. You do this for me. This. So the consultant thought, oh my gosh, I got this juicy piece of information. I'm going to go tell the CEO his brilliant plan isn't working at all, and I'm going to earn my money as a consultant. So he runs the CEO and says, hey, guess what? There's this whole exchange of ideas where everybody's kind of trading ideas and sharing ideas and you know, brokering ideas. And you know, they're not coming up with original ideas. He goes, CEO's like, that's fine. So I was like, what do you mean? He goes, that's exactly what I want. I want people talking about new ideas. I want them exchanging ideas. I want them talking to each other about ideas for productivity and things like that. So think about, could you create an environment where once they play a game, people cheat 
that's okay because now they're exchanging ideas and information. Now it's got to be set up correctly, but it can be very valuable where they're exchanging information. So think about setting up feedback and how you want feedback to work within the organization. And uh, think about you know, leaderboards. I always say the first 10 people on a leaderboard, love it. The 11th person, nah, not so much. The 100th person hates it, right? It's demotivating. But you can still use leaderboards for learning, but use a group leaderboard or use a leaderboard where the person compares themselves to what they did before. That's the gap between what you're doing now and what you're doing uh, in the future. So that's a really good way to use leaderboard. And leaderboard also are excellent feedback. Why is a leaderboard excellent feedback? Because I don't have to explain to you that you need to try to be at the top of the leaderboard. As soon as you see the leaderboard, you're like, I need to be at the top of the leaderboard. So they're kind of self-correcting, uh, self-goal-guiding elements. So be aware, one, that not everybody likes leaderboards. And two, uh, leaderboards can be helpful if they help you compare yourself or if they're a group-based leaderboard. People don't want to let down the group, so they uh, contribute to the leaderboard. It's OK if I fail myself, but boy, I don't want to let my colleagues down. So uh, instructional designers, we're always looking to the future, right? Every one of these conferences I go to, we're talking about AR and AI and all these things that are going to you know, replace somebody. But actually, in 2017, guess how many new board games were created? So these are like Monopoly, Settlers of Catan, 5,000 new board games in 2017. So, we don't always need to think about the latest and greatest technology. We can think about good old fashioned card and board games. In fact, one of the researchers, uh, some, one of the things that researchers think about is that we don't get people together very often. So if we get them together in a game environment, we can actually maximize the experience. So this is a game, for example, that we did for a company. And in the middle is the dashboard. And there are sales and operations, products and technology, and GNA, general administration. And they had dilemma cards, and they had the dilemma, and they made a choice. And each choice had consequences. And if each of the three teams worked independently, because they were all like teams of nine, three people on each team, if they worked independently, they could do OK. If they worked together, they would do fantastically. But we didn't tell them that. We said, here's a game. Try to maximize uh, the dashboard. See how much money you can make, right? and the teams that didn't work together, and then we debriefed them. And there were some real aha moments. And the research indicates that if you want to debrief or use a game for learning, it should be a three-step process. The first process, the first step is like you set up the game. Okay, here's what you're going to do. Here's some things you're going to look out for. Here's how you're going to play it, et cetera. The second step is to play the game. The third step is the debriefing. Okay, what did you learn in the game? How would you apply it to your situation? What would you do if this happened? So make sure that you think about that three-part setup if you're going to use a game for learning. And if you're going to bring people together, think about using games to do that. Here was a game. This was for pharmaceutical sales called Total Recall because it was Total Call. You came in. If you, said the you picked a card from the receptionist, if you um, said the wrong thing or chose the wrong answer, you had to go into the waiting room. If you did the right thing, you could pro uh, uh, progress to the healthcare professional. So think about ways that you can leverage this. This is a game. Um, does anybody have to do role play training? Some people know, yeah. And do people, it looks like they love your role plays. They love to do role plays. No? People don't like role plays? No. Or they collude? OK. Um, so uh, the game Zombie Sales Apocalypse is a role play game. But instead of a role play, each card has a role on it. And people can challenge you as you play the role. And now people are actually eager to do the role plays because they're doing that challenge. So that's another way to think about it to do it. OK, so summary. Uh, as I put this up here, I will ask if there are other questions that I could answer. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he's way over there for you. She knows he's making you run. Hi, thanks. You, uh, you talked about bringing the learning uh, to life under the umbrella of a story. But previously and subsequently, you talked about um, skills maps. How do those two things fit together? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So, um, so there's two answers to that. One is sometimes uh, you can't always use a story, so the skills map would be separate. But sometimes you can use a story, and it takes much more effort, but to embed the story within the skills map. So each skill has a certain element of the story that you're trying to tell. It's a much more, uh, if it's not done right, it's very disjointed. But if it's done right, it all works together very smoothly. So you might have a story about the hunter, about the warrior. You might have a story about the purchase order uh, person, the, the provisioner. You might have a story about the accounts receivable person. You might have a story about accounts um, payable. And kind of all of them have different aspects of the story. And it can all come together as one element, depending on which direction you want to go. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like um, those branching storybooks. So you have to map. I mean, we've literally like mapped out a wall like this with the post-it notes of how the story is going to go. We do use a tool. I'll mention this because it's a free tool called Chat Mapper by a company called LearnBright, and uh, it does hierarchical conversational mapping, and uh, that can be a very effective tool for doing kind of the branching simulations. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Uh, a question over here. Hi. Hi. Um, you've referenced quite a few kind of papers and uh, research studies in your uh, talk, which I appreciate. Um, is there any good places you'd recommend us to look for, like the latest research for games and or any good publications that you'd kind of? Yeah. So to? good question. So a couple things. So uh, I wrote a book called The Gamification of Learning and Instruction. So uh, it's a white white covered book. So it has a lot of good information, a lot of research foundation. If you kind of need to argue for gains in, in your organization. Um, but then um, I have a blog called Cop Notes. And if you follow me on Twitter, I'm constantly abstracting articles from research and, and putting them on there as well. Um, you could follow people. There's a woman named Amy Jo Kim who's done some great work on gamification. Um, um, Hunkel, uh, what is her first name? I'm drawing a total blank. Uh, if anybody remembers, but her, she's doing some really good work. Um, uh, Stanford has a human AI lab that has a website that they're constantly posting papers on. Um, that's a good uh, reference as well. Uh, there's a journal called Simulation and Games. It's an online free journal. Uh, you can check that out as well. Um, so those are some areas that, that, that could be helpful. Great. Uh, do we have one time for one more question? Do you have anyone brave enough to ask one more question before cocktail hour? No? OK. <laughs> uh, OK. I think on Maslow's hierarchy, uh, cocktail hour even trumps food. Hello. I, I have a question. Um, what is your experience with learning via a game to transfer it, that to the real life? OK, yeah. So I. Um, Two things. One, there has to be an effort. So you can't create a game, let people play it, and assume they're going to transfer it to real life. You actually have to have um, that bridge. You have to do that debriefing. You have to ask them to reflect. And you have to ask them to recall the experience in the game to, ha to happen. But I've seen some really robust research showing that there is transferability from the game situation to the work situation. So we've seen simulations do that. There's a woman named Tracy Sitzman who did a meta-analysis, which is a study of studies. And she found that game-based learning was 20% more effective learning transfer than um, classroom instruction. So uh, there, are, there is research out there to do that, but you have to make an effort to do that. You can't just say, OK, learners, we're going to play a game. OK, good. I'm glad you're all done. Now let's go. The other thing is um, you've got to make sure that the rules and how to play the game are not so involved that people spend the time learning the rules and not learning the content or the actions you want them to do. So you have to be careful about that as well. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely, there's definitely an art to uh, a little bit of an art. You know, we talk about things robots can't do. There's an art between balancing learning in a game and balancing fun or engagement in the game, and you do that through play testing. So we always recommend you paper prototype, uh, paper prototype games before you go ahead and design them in technology so that you know that they're going to work. So yeah, great question. So thanks, everybody. I'm out of time. I really appreciate your attention. And uh, enjoy cocktail hour. <laughs>